And welcome back to some of the Cooler Jets podcast where it was Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. Well, Michael, we promised a podcast would be coming out on Wednesday. It's not the mailbag. It's an interview with the MVP from Sunday's game, it's Morstead. Thomas, it's been quite the week for you. You were the MVP on Sunday. You won uh, ASB, AFC Special Teams Player of the Week today. You won Monday Night Football's Hemi. I didn't even know that was an award. You were on Pat McAfee. And now you're on Cool Your Jets, which is probably the coolest accomplishment of all of it. So, uh, no doubt, man. I'm doing great. It's been a a blur of a past few days, for sure. A lot is of it, fun. Is it weird getting this much attention? Um, I don't know if weird is the right way to describe it, but um, – yeah, I mean, it's uh, certainly appreciated. Uh, it's been, been, uh, it's been the whole season's been phenomenal. Just being a part of this team, and we've made a lot of big plays throughout the season, so it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I was, I was listening to you in your post game interview, and you obviously seemed like you were really embracing the moment. You know, you're somebody in the back nine of your career, really trying to soak in something like this. Where does, where does Sunday rank in terms of your, your best games and your favorite memories? Obviously, the onside kick in the Super Bowl has to be number one, but. Outside of that, I would imagine Sunday was it was a pretty special day. Yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, as far as memory goes, it'll be up there high. Um, as far as best games I've ever had, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it was that. I mean, we made some big plays in the game, uh, but I mean, I'd like to have three punts back in the game that that weren't what I'd like. Um, I doesn't mean they were bad, but they weren't you know exactly what I was trying to do. Um, but you know, a lot of times when you you have a really good game and you punt twice or three times, it's not as you know, it's just not as uh, notable, I guess, uh, by the fans and the public. So um, yeah, it was a super memorable game, and uh, it was a lot of fun to be a part of. Yeah, and I know fans had a lot of fun watching it, even during the game. By the time the game was over, you were already a hero. So we saw you running off the field triumphantly on the wind cam that was posted after. How did that moment feel? running off and did Jets fans say anything funny in that moment? I know Jets fans kind of have some funny comments sometimes. So anything that stood out in that moment to you? Uh, not specifically that moment. I mean, you know, we, I, I don't know if we punted six or seven times in the first half, but it was like, I mean, people were just letting me have the good energy um, and bad energy. Cause we're, you know, remember it was an away game for us. It was mainly Giants fans. Yeah, so I was, yeah. I was hearing all sorts of stuff uh, throughout the game and, and uh, people took note, I guess. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was super cool to just, you know, have such a big impact on a game that was um, normally when you're punting a lot, you know, it doesn't equate to a win. So to do that, you know, we needed every single yard came down to the last second, getting that spike with one second left. I mean, every single thing mattered and it was cool, cool to have it turn out the way it did. How, how much do you actually hear when you're on the sideline in terms of fans yelling? Um, quite a bit. Um, you know, some people don't like to – I know some guys that wear earplugs and they try to – they don't want to hear any of the negativity. Um, I kind of like it. I, <laughs> you know, I love playing away games uh, or, you know, having the away fans for trash talk and the banter. It's, um, it's uh, you know – it's something that kind of gets me jacked up a little bit, so I enjoy it. What's the funniest piece of smack talk you've heard? Uh, Maybe in your career I, or this year I, from a road I fan? Couldn't, I, I couldn't repeat it. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, it's probably not PG, but how about something PG? No, What's I the... mean, every, every now and then I'll, I'll respond back with something that's, you know, it, it's more to kind of catch them off guard or, or get a rise out of them. You kind of try to – sometimes you almost try to make, make – uh, the away the, the, the team if you're the away team if the the home crowd's really ragging you and you it's, you can hear somebody repeatedly sometimes they try to come up with something clever to get them to know that uh you know kind of get them to give me a little bit of like a touche type of look you know like um uh, respect you know um, so you know but i can't come i can't think of something that comes to mind that's pg unfortunately <laughs> course not but uh but like you said this game came down to the end and even on that last play you were a part of that and uh that last hold seemed like it was a little tough you know it was poor conditions out there ball was wet um so that hold at the end uh, can you take us through that a little bit it seemed like it was you know maybe a lower snap and you were able to corral that and get it up yeah i would just say that um between me and greg and and thomas Hennessy, um we've all been operating at a super high level and um the nice thing is that we all have such high standards 
individually for each of our ourselves. And so, um, you know, if the ball's a little low, if, if I don't hold it exactly right, you know, Greg's going to make me right. We kind of all have that sort of energy about it. We just know over the course of time, if everybody's operating at those standards, um, we're going to have a lot of success. And so, you know, I'm just process focused in that moment. I don't really think of it as if there's a high snap or low snap or if it's wet or anything, it's just, just see the ball, put it down on the spot and get out the way. Let Greg do his thing. I noticed you don't even look up until after the kick is, is, is that like a superstition or is that just part of like the routine? You don't want to mess it up. It's, a, it's just a process thing. You know, it's kind of like golf and, you know, people pick their head up immediately to see where their ball goes and you start picking your head up too soon. And so I was like, why wouldn't I take that sort of mentality and practice, uh, you know, uh, that type of practice to the way I hold. I can't control if Greg hits it well or not. All I can control is if I put the ball on the spot exactly how I want it and give him the best chance to make it. So um, once the ball is kicked, I just, as feedback, I always tap the ground uh, on the spot as kind of like, hey, I, I hit the spot. And I just, it's a habit. So I don't, I don't want to get in this thing of catching the ball, looking up and, you know, screwing something up. I just want to focus on my job. And so Greg always lets me know if it goes in. It's funny because that the, uh, the kick to go to overtime, I thought he missed because of the crowd reaction. And that took me, you know, it took me a second to realize, oh, we're, we're in Giants Stadium today. We're not in, right. you know, it's, it's a Giants home game. <laughs> to, be, so. to be fair, I thought he missed it too, watching on the TV. No, I'm talking about the first one that was oh, oh, that yeah. was that was right down the pipe. The second one was actually tipped. Um that's oh, why yeah. I hooked left. Uh it was tipped by uh I think it was number ninety seven, got his thumb on it. If you go watch the all twenty two copy, you can see yeah. it hit his hand and deflect. So yeah, speaking of field goals that were kind of altered by uh, you know, the rush, Will McDonald had to play um on the missed field goal near the end of the fourth quarter where he leaped over the line and uh got right in the way of that kick. I mean, how much from your perspective? Do you think that can affect a field goal? Because he didn't actually block it, but he was, you know, right down the middle there. So do you think that could have had an effect on that field goal? Uh, I don't know if it did or didn't, but um, to say it, to say it could or couldn't, I don't know. I mean, do guys feel pressure? Do they feel color? Sure they do. Um, did it make him miss it? I don't know. Uh, but I do know is that if it would have gone straight, he would have blocked it. So yeah. um, it was a great play by him. And um you know, it was, it was just a great play by him. So it's cool to know we've got that in the bag. And it's also cool that teams know that we've got that in the bag too. You know, we'll have to game plan accordingly and we'll set something else up off of it. Yeah, and I have one more question about the reaction to your performance because obviously it's been a lot of positivity, which is well-deserved, but there was one specific outlet I saw that wasn't a huge fan of your performance. PFF gave you a 61 grade. For this game, which Garbage. if you're not familiar, that's pretty mediocre by their standards. So do you have a response to that on PFF thinking you were mediocre in this game? I know you said you had a couple you want back, but still 61 seems low. Yeah, I don't really have a response to that. Um, yeah, I don't really have a response for it. Uh, Brees Hall, Brees Hall is upset with them too. They, they're pretty low on him. They, they have a bad track record with the Jets. Um, yeah, no, they're, they're Jets haters. Um, Got it. It's a razor thin margin with this team between being six and one and zero oh and seven. And the reason the Jets are four and three, I think a large part is due to special teams. Um, obviously, it's not the season we were all expecting at the start, although we'll see how this this thing unfolds. Um, but it takes a, a special group to be able to block out the noise, respond to the adversity and, and capture on the big moments. What is it about this unit that that, you know, just has allowed it to come through in the clutch time in and, and time out? Um, I just think we're process focused. Every play matters. Um, doesn't matter what the score is. Guys are just trying to be great and do their job at a high level. And um, that's easier said than done. Um, you know, I think generally speaking, if your specialists are playing well, it really can um, it can synergize to having a really good special teams unit. You know, if, if guys are running to cover to this spot and I kick it way over here. That can be even if guys win, they can like play themselves out of the play by me kicking it the wrong way. So I think just everybody having a certain understanding of trust that when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it, or I'm going to do it close to what we've asked, and guys, we're all going to kind of be on the same page, you know. And um, 
it's just simple as that. I think guys are playing their asses off. Um, and I think everybody realizes that if we really want to win these games, um, you know, we're going to have to make plays on special teams. And it's exciting to be a part of. Yeah, and speaking of the adversity with this team, obviously it goes back to the very first offensive drive of the year oh. when Aaron Rodgers <laughs> goes down. So can, can you take us through what you were thinking in that moment um, and how kind of the team was able to respond and rally after that? Yeah, I remember in the second quarter of that game, you know, looking around at some of the older guys that had signed, that probably a lot of them had signed with the idea that they were going to have a chance to play with Aaron and, and maybe have a chance to go make a run at, at the Super Bowl. And I, I remember looking around, some of those guys see their faces. And I was like, all right, we're going to see what we got here because, you know, this could absolutely crumble those guys um, if they're not the right guys. And, and, um, and no one's blinked, you know, everybody's acknowledged the reality of what, the situation and he's not our quarterback now. And, and uh, we're rolling forward, you know, and guys uh, don't take for granted the opportunity because, you know, thinking you'll have another one next year, especially if you're older, you know, that's not the case always. So um Guys have just hung in there, um, hung in there like an old set of balls, as my old coach used to say. And uh, we are hanging in there, hanging tough. And, um, you know, seeing him out in pregame every week is pretty cool. You know, seeing him do a little more than he did the week before, out there flipping it around and kind of leading to hope that maybe he would come back at some point this season. So we'll see. Uh, there's been a lot of discourse about the MetLife turf this season. And obviously Roger's injury was – potentially tied to it. Al Woods had an injury this week to uh, other offensive linemen. So I'm sure it's something that the guys in the locker room talk about. What do you make of the MetLife turf? Is it a, as big of a deal as, as fans are talking about it as? Well, I mean, look, it, if injuries happen. It's a, it's a nasty game uh, from that same point. But I think if you go look at the statistics, injuries happen a little less on grass. And so look, it's, it's uh you know, I understand the argument of we got two teams playing on this, so you don't want to have, you know, you don't want to have grass growing up here in November. That's not a consistent surface. But at the same time, um, you know, there's teams like Pittsburgh and Philadelphia that share their fields constantly with college teams. You know, Pittsburgh Steelers play, share their field with Pitt, and uh, the Eagles, I think, share their field with maybe Temple, yeah. maybe another team as well, um, and they make it work. So I think there's a way to make it work. Um, at the end of the day, players, you know, players generally speaking want to play on grass. And so, you know, hopefully we'll keep pushing that needle down, um, down the road. To, you know, at the end of the day, I think everybody's got, everybody'd like to see players have the best chance to stay healthy and avoid injuries. And from standpoint for the NFL, which I think that generally speaking, they'd like to avoid that as well. Um, and you want your best players out there. You know, you don't want the, the league is the league is a lesser league with Aaron not playing. You know, it's um, and you should want your best players. And so, if you can limit the risks on those, with how much money is at stake for the the business and and the games, you know, you want to do everything you can to limit those. So uh, that's that's my spiel on it. I mean, yeah, I think all of us fans watching. I mean, we're not on the field, but it just looks like a tough surface to be playing, especially when it rains. I mean, obviously the surface was all right for you. I mean, it seemed like the ball was just placing exactly where you wanted it to be. I don't know if that's more on on the control you're you're putting on it, or just the surface being kind of a, I don't know. It was just a swamp. I, it I think like. I think it was easier to be a little aggressive just because it was it was really wet, and so the ball was dying a little more. It wasn't checking super hard one way or the other, and so kind of allowed me to be a little more aggressive and getting it a little closer to the goal line. And, uh, yeah, but to say I can control that it's going to bounce forward or back is I don't know anybody that can legitimately look me in the eye without lying <laughs> and tell me they're able to do that. So that's why hang time is important. You give those guys, a, um, you know, as much time as possible to get down there to where you don't even have to leave it up to the bounce if you can help it. One of the que This might be a dumb question, but when we were watching week one and Xavier Gibson runs back, the punt return, and everybody's going crazy – there was a lot of discourse about Sam Martin's lack of a, of an attempt on the tackle. I've always wondered, do punters actually practice tackling or is it just kind of one of those things where you just run into that when you get there? Um, I can't only speak for myself. Um, I don't practice tackling. <laughs> um, uh, and everybody's different on how they do it, how they deal with it. So, um, yeah, I mean, 
I think the worst thing that could happen is is just having um, having a an idea of how you want to go about making a tackle if it comes through and and being like committed to it. So, um, you know, I joke that I've got the probably got the highest injury rate in league history per tackle. I think I've probably got like seven or eight documented injuries on 12 tackles or something like that. So, um, what's your anyways, technique? You know, you, I mean, are you willing to give that away? It probably isn't one. Um, I mean, I have an idea. Of, uh, yeah. I won't give away how, the way I think about it, but, um, but yeah, I'm not exactly the most graceful guy. So, um, you know, I'm more like a runaway freight train that doesn't know how to slow down. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, it's going to be a big collision. And, um, uh, if I, you know, if I can get to the hit point, so, um, that's about it. Me, me going side to side is no bueno. Yeah. I mean, tackling technique, we definitely, I don't think we'll be going to you for those tips anytime soon, but punting, I am curious to hear a little bit about what went into this game you had. Um, I know you just said, you know, with the rain, it kind of made it easier for you to be aggressive and kind of get those, you know, soft bounces near the goal line and that it yep. can be hard to really control that. So yep. what is your perspective when you're doing those punts? Because you had three where you were past your own your own 40. And, you know, considering how hard it is to control the bounce, what is kind of your per, your like overall goal when you're making those punts, knowing you can't really control the bounce? How do you, what do you try to control within what you can control to get the best result on those punts? Well, I think direction helps, right? So if you're, if you're, you know, if you're angling, if you're straight and the ball hits and it's going to bounce forward or backwards, it maybe give yourself a better chance if you have an angle and maybe it'll have a better chance of going out of bounds. Um, that's one thing. And then also it's just, you know, how deep are you trying to hit the ball? Where are your gunners? Are they playing singles or doubles outside? That may dictate kind of how aggressive I am as well knowing that, hey, this guy should get down there relatively quickly or that, hey, he's getting double teamed, maybe it's a different play. So you kind of take all that information in at one time and just kind of, I don't know, it's like a computer just spits out like how I'm going to try to hit the ball. and um, But I couldn't I couldn't sit here and give you an equation that would tell you exactly how I do it. Right. So I think that part of that's just experience of being in games and knowing what's worked in the past and and you're constantly hedging to try to, hit the optimal ball for the situation. Yeah. And it's been such a great team effort to watch too, because you've been great, but then the whole unit, the way guys are getting down there to down punts and make tackles has been great. Yeah, uh, Guys are, guys are covering their mouths. So yeah. No doubt about it. Yeah. And one of those guys who had two tackles in this game was Thomas Hennessy, the long snapper. And he's been, you know, for a long snapper, a really active guy in coverage. He had the most tackles among long snappers since he joined the jets in 2017. So can you talk a little bit about, uh, Thomas and like his excellence as a long snapper, what he brings to the unit. Yeah, he just has the highest standards for himself, and that's why. And so does Greg, and that's why we all get along so well. I think because we all expect more from ourselves individually than anybody in the group expects from us. So just high standards. That's simple as that. Uh, he's a great pro, and he's become a really close friend of mine, and it's been a lot of fun um, having success as a group. All right, two more for you, Thomas. One, I'm sure you're getting tired of of being asked about you sprinting after extra points and even after a good punt sprinting down the field. I just I have a bit of a request, actually. I mean, you don't have to oblige if you don't want, but can we get can we get the jet celebration when you're doing the sprints, especially after a, a great a great punt? We as Jets fans have been wanting a jet player to be doing the jet celebration that Santonio Holmes used to do when we were watching his kids. No Jets player. Uses the jet celebration, so I don't know. Maybe well, you can well, what, what 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 is the jet celebration? Well, you got it. You got it. Yeah, yeah. You go like this, and then you very you simple. Fly down like the arms oh, out yeah, like yeah. this. Yeah. So okay, I don't know. Next cool. next time you hit something inside the five, you're doing a sprint. You maybe hit a little jet, a little tone time. I'll, you know what? I'll think about it. Let me go do some video searching on YouTube and see exactly what yeah, you just guys look up. San Antonio about. Holmes. He's yeah, yeah. the he's the <laughs> signature of that. All right, perfect. But, uh, I'll look it right. up. You got to get that back. Last one. Last one. Uh, you've been on plenty of good teams, plenty of playoff teams. Uh, what are just the biggest keys to making it through the dog days of, of the season and staying focused week in and week out and, you know, tuning out that noise? What are just the, the big keys that you've seen in, in teams that have made that march all the way to the playoffs? Uh, as a team, I think all good teams at some point in the season get on, get on a little bit of a run. Um, that's one thing. And then I would say the other thing is you just you you just kind of reset every week, good, bad or ugly. Just go back to what's your process, what's your routine, and uh, you just try to 
you know, have a plan that you just, you just execute the same plan every week that, 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 you know, sometimes the days are long but the weeks just fly by during the season. If you're doing that and you get into this groove and once you can find that groove, it's, it's a good place to be, you know? So it's, it's uh, tough because every year we're a team, every team's young, relatively speaking. And, um, you know, it's important for, to get those young guys figuring that out as quick as possible. Uh, uh, Thomas, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on the podcast. Third time you have the record. Um, we really appreciate you taking time. I also, I appreciate the ambient locker room noise in the background. I don't know who's playing ping pong or whatever's going on there, but I uh, wanted to that, give you guys a, 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 re, a real feel of what it's like yeah. to be a player. You know, yeah, I mean, it's locker room a lot, talk. A lot, of, a lot of banter, a lot of uh, competitive games going on in here. It's good. It's good. Uh, it's good locker room to be in. Uh, I don't if know you if you can share, what's the what's the favorite locker room game? Is it ping pong? That seems pretty common. We got some we got some pretty competitive uh, cornhole going on right now. Oh, nice. Um, the the who? tight ends are the tight end group is phenomenal. The tight end group, uh, um, they're always competing, and then uh, Max Mitchell is part of that. Uh, so it's good. That's that, and we also got some ping pong action, and uh, Greg and some of the quarterbacks are some of the, some of the really good players on the uh, ping pong table. Are you, are you more of a ping pong guy or a cornhole guy? I'm, I'm definitely a cornhole guy. Okay. Definitely. That seems kind of, that's kind of like punting. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know if you have anything you want to plug. I'll cut this out if not, but I just want to give you a chance if there's anything you No, All, all right, good. Cool. Just keep, keep, uh, keep showing up and get loud at the stadium. It's been fun. Let's keep it all going. Right. We, you get three of the next four games are, are prime time. I mean, oh, the next two are prime time. Then you got the bills game and then that, that black Friday yeah. game. So, Big stage the next couple of yep. weeks for the Jets. Very excited to, to watch how the rest of the season unfolds, Thomas. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. And as a, you, you've been the MVP of the season so far. So it's, it's been really cool uh, talking to you the last few months. And best of luck um, for the rest of the year. Okay. Thanks for having me on, guys. See you. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Bye. All right. And that was Thomas Morstead, punter from the New York Jets. Um, always appreciate uh, talking to him. It's our, it's, yeah, it's our third interview with Thomas. So maybe we'll get number four um around playoff time with, with Aaron Rodgers maybe um all right you can follow us at Pod on Twitter myself Ben W Blessington Michael Michael underscore Nania uh we'll be back on Friday with our mailbag um talking about uh the trade deadline talking mailbag what am I saying talking about we'll be back on Friday with our preview pod um talking about uh the trade deadline talking about what we saw from the all 22 of the Giants game and then looking ahead to Monday night's game against the Chargers so thank you everybody for listening have a great week go Jets